is currently in a teacher education program who is a student in okay and is anyone a student in a research program right now okay and everyone else is faculty or something else I assume okay Yes, professors. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Michael Giamalaro. As, as uh, Jean-Philippe said, I'm a professor at Oregon State University. I also teach in a teacher um, prep program, a teacher education program. Um, and this is, this is the heart of my research, so really the, the talk will um, tell itself. Um, just for a little background, uh, I was also a teacher. I was a biologist and then I was a, a teacher in middle and high school science classrooms. Uh, and so that was very formative for me. That definitely formed how I think about education, how I think about learning, and certainly how I think about contextualization. Uh, so I'm gonna jump back here where the slides are. Um, since this is a talk about contextualization, I thought I'd start with a little context. Has anyone here been to Oregon by any chance? Okay, all right, nice, awesome. So this is probably what you think of if you think of Oregon. So we're on the west coast, looks like British Columbia. Um, uh, just lots of rainforest, water, waterfalls. Um, that's what most people think of when they think of Oregon or the coast, which is um, very much like your coast over here. Rugged, cold water. Um, we're at about the same latitude, by the way, as, as you are here. Um, but that's just half of Oregon. This is where I live in Oregon. This is right in the middle. So the Cascade Mountains are the spine of Oregon. Uh, so lots of snow, lots of skiing. So I saw lots of skiing driving over here today. So if you want to come out there, we'd love to have you. Um, and then it's also the whole eastern side is very desert. Um, so this is uh, very uh, all these dry river canyons, or um, this is at spring runoff, so we have a little bit more water. But it's a very diverse state in terms of the topography. So everything from rainforest to absolute desert. Um, one other thing, um, uh, Jean-Philippe said you can ask questions at the end. Please do ask questions in the middle if you have them too. I would, I would love to answer them as you need them. Um, my students are very good at challenging me when they, they think I am crazy or saying something that doesn't make sense. I hope you'll do the same. Um, that will keep this um, more of a conversation and a lot more fun. So um, just to walk you through what we are going to do today, let me move that cursor. Um, so we're, we're gonna look at what is experience? That's a really big question. We're just gonna touch on it a, a little bit. I'm sure we all have our own definitions of what that is. I'll give you mine and, uh, and certainly based on the talk. Um, is anyone here, I know at least one person's familiar with Dewey. Does anyone else know John Dewey or John Dewey's work? Okay, I'm seeing some nods. Okay, um, so I'll try to weave that in a little bit. Um, and then how do we learn from context? And it, it sounds like uh, many of you are in, in Jean-Philippe's class and you've talked about this. Um, I'll give you my version. Hopefully they're pretty similar. Um, and then we'll talk about the impact of um, contextualization on learning. And then finally, uh, if I have time, I'll get to some examples of how I've used this, uh, this idea in uh, mostly in research, but also in some curriculum design and, and working with some school districts. So I just want to start with a few video vignettes, and these are just around um, experiential education. So what you'll see is just some clips. These are from um, all this research project I did, and these are all students talking about how they came to understand tides, so you know the, the ocean going up and up and down um, in a cyclical way. So this is, in this project, how they came to understand it. I noticed that when we were uh, near Chocolaski, we kind of got out of the Gulf a little. Um, I think the tide was on our side, and we were just like cruising through there. That was kind of when I really uh, realized like how helpful the tides could be if you like uh, understand it and know it, so you can use it. So out here, are the tides going to have much influence? Uh, no. They'll have some influence, but not nearly as much influence as the entire body of water. Or if we get into even a little channel here or a channel here. So if you just like walk out there and it was so strong, then 
So um, those students are, this is down in the Everglades in Florida, um, and they are learning about tides by being there, right? By, I'm trying to paddle my canoe and I'm rowing against the tide. That's really hard. When I'm paddling with it, it's much easier. The one young lady was talking about walking in the water and the tide's pushing against her leg. So this very visceral um, experience with coming to know tides. Um, but certainly at that point, um, if I asked, well, what causes tides, there's, there's nothing there, right? It's just I understand what's happening with tides, but I don't necessarily know why they're happening. And so um, let's connect that to this. this visceral experience to getting some explanation for it. But it's still very much in context, right? They're standing on the beach, they had just come out of the water, um, and the teacher was connecting, you know, what's happening at a level that the students can't understand uh, through experience because, you know, they're not in a spaceship, right? They're not actually seeing what's happening um, at the global level. But, but they can take that abstract piece and connect it to their own experience. And then this final one, Oh, sorry. Hey, now. There we go. And now, for the day we were at the Korean piece, we had the day off, I was laying, like, um, right next to that red mango, the actual white mango. Um, oh, we were having this, not the sort of hours, but like the free time in mm -hmm. the morning, mm -hmm. um, I was writing my journal and I was watching the tide, um, the high tide coming mm -hmm. along the way, and um, I saw the high tide um, like slowly covered um, being natural. I think that was the moment I was like, yeah, this is how it works, we just all make friends that way. So um, in this case, the student came to her own realization, right? So she had gotten all the information at some point in the past, but it didn't necessarily make sense. Let me give you a little information about these nomatophores. So these are root structures on mangroves. So mangroves are these trees that live in salt water. Um, it's not a great place to live for a plant because um, salt water is going to suck all the water out of you. Um, and so these pneumatophores are structures on the roots that allow the plants to um, get rid of the salt and live in the salt water. Um, she had heard all that information, but she just had to be sitting there watching the tide come up, wrap around the, the root structures to, to finally understand that, to come to that understanding. And so when we look at all of these, uh, sorry, it keeps doing that. 
Um, so when we look at all of these types of experiences, they seem really dramatic, right? I mean, uh, when I talk to people about this, it seems like, oh yes, I wish I could have learned that way. And certainly there's a lot of power here, um, but it's not uh, always necessarily going to be that way, right? I mean, it's just, it was probably more likely that um, a student is sitting on the beach and thinking about Facebook or thinking about something totally different other than pneumatophores, right? It, it's not a guarantee that just sticking a kid on a beach is going to make them understand the relationship of mangroves to tides. It takes a lot more than that. And so um, Dewey talked about the having of an experience, right? And so uh, hopefully uh, this doesn't get too lost in the language, but there is a difference between experience, this general idea of experience, and having an experience. If it's hard to remember experience in general. If I asked you to remember um, a, uh, sitting through a lecture in your 10th grade chemistry class, you're probably going to be hard pressed to remember the details. Um, but if I ask you to remember um, an important experience um, that happened to you in 10th grade, you're much more likely to remember that. So there's a distinction to have an experience. So what, what is that? How do we get there? What, how do we get to this place of having something memorable happen for students? And not only that, but how do we do that in a way that students are learning what we want them to learn, right? As, as teachers, we can't just say, well, I hope my students learn something, right? We, we have to have them learn specific things. And we can argue whether those are the right things um, maybe another time. But um, certainly, that's, uh, that is what we are mandated to do as teachers. And so how do we bring that experience to a place where it can um, turn into uh, learning in a, in a more prescribed way? Um, and so uh, as you look at the experiential learning literature, as, as you talk to um, experiential educators like the, the ones that were in that study, um, they're, they're proponents, right? They are, they are selling this. This is something that um, every student should be doing. But there's a, there's a lack of attention to detail. Like how do we get there? How do we make an experience um, something that is going to be educative? Um, and so there's all these questions around it, right? Is, is experiential learning the best way to do it? Um, how does experience impact learning? We kind of have a sense, right? We feel in our hearts that it works, but that's not usually good enough, right? Especially if you're doing research or trying to justify um, leading experiential education in your classroom. Um, how can we make it even better? How do we get all of the students to be sitting on the beach and making those, those deep connections? Um, I talked about an experience. Um, and how do, we, uh, how do we specifically target math and science and uh, French and other languages uh, specifically within this experience? And then, this is a big one for administrators. This is expensive, right? I mean, even if you're just talking about time, doing this stuff is hard. You have to get out there. You have to spend time in the field. Even if you're doing it entirely in the classroom, it's time consuming. And it's usually expensive, partly because of time, but just the logistics of doing it. So if, if this is going to happen, it has to be worth it, right? It has to be more than just um, what we typically see in a classroom. This was, uh, I was just at a, a research conference with, with Jean-Philippe in, in Baltimore, and this was right outside the, the conference venue. There's this little shack sitting on the water, they have some boats, and it's uh, living classrooms, learning by doing. And I love that they have this sign there. Watch your step. Be careful when you're doing this. Um, too often it happens in a way that is just, well, I'm just going to have my students have an experience and not necessarily put any thought into what that experience is and what I want to get out of it or what I want my students to get out of it. So I came up with this um, uh, definition of contextualization that I think just starts to answer that question of how do we make an experience uh, more tied to context. And so um, it's a degree to which the content knowledge and the, and the context are entwined, right? How do they come together for the learner, um, but also for curriculum? So we can contextualize, contextualize curriculum, 
we can contextualize learning, we can measure these things, and that's what I felt we needed, is to have a construct that worked for all of those things. I will say that it's imperfect. It is not the best uh, it possibly could be, so maybe if, you've, I, if you have ideas, I would love to hear them to, to make it even better. Um, so, um, I'm sorry about all the words on this slide. I'll talk you through it a little bit. Um, does contextualization work? Does it help learning? Um, and one answer is yes. Um, you might be able to predict the other answer is no. Uh, but yes, so there's, there's a fair amount of um, research that shows that contextualization increases interest and motivation and attitude. Um, certainly some of that work's been done here. Um, there is some work that has shown that contextualization increases understanding or comprehension of content knowledge. Uh, but it's not, huge, it's not a huge effect, right? So, so if your only goal is to increase content knowledge, um, then the existing research doesn't probably support the expense that it takes to, to do that. Um, however, deeper knowledge, it, it has been shown in a number of cases to do that. Um, students have used context. Um, the, the piece of, this is a, an international assessment on math. Um, and it, it, they're very contextualized math problems and students have been used, uh, have been taught to use the context to solve these problems effectively. Um, and then this is really all, of, uh, this is really all about moving back and forth between contexts. So when students learn in context, um, they can be taught to more effectively move that knowledge, transfer that knowledge to other contexts. Um, and then finally, just very broadly, field learning experiences um, can be useful, but, but they have to be done right, is essentially the, the conclusion of this paper. So it's very positive for contextualization. Um, but on the other hand, there's actually a fair amount of research that says no, contextualization is not necessarily um, a good thing. And so um, in some of these studies, um, students are not able to recall as much. If they, if they study a problem with context, they cannot remember it as well. Um, they can, math story problems, you probably have personal experiences with these. They either, you either love them or you don't. That's, it seems like a, it splits the population in general. Um, there, there's this idea of seductive details. So when you are reading contextualized curriculum, um, it's easy to get lost in the details, right? If you are um, reading a math problem about um, how long it takes to get to Montreal on the train, is there a train from here? Okay, well, then it's a bad problem. <laughs> on the bus, right? I mean, if, if you're reading about that and, and all you're thinking about is, well, which bus stop should I take? And um, oh, I hate the bus, I really wish I could drive. I mean, you get lost in those details really quickly because of contextualization, right? I mean, you are attaching your understanding of that problem to, the, to a different context um, and you're losing sight of the content. Um, so essentially that causes cognitive overload. There's just too much to think about. And uh, Gilbert talks about decorative contextualization where you have content and then you kind of layer some context onto it. Right? And that's, that's what happens here. So the big difference between this group of studies and the last group of studies is that these tend to be in psychometrics, they tend to be in um, very simple psychology experiments um, where you're in a lab, you read something quickly, and then you test it. They're not necessarily done in, in the context of the classroom um, like the other ones. So I still think there is hope for it. Um, but I do think that we need to measure it better. So, um, there are some different uh, frameworks for looking at contextualization, so um, certainly I'm presenting mine. Um, others, I feel like, look at smaller chunks of it and very important chunks. Um, Gilbert is looking very much at curriculum and these four different directions for thinking about curriculum and context in curriculum. Um, so uh, I can go over those if anyone's interested, but I'll probably keep moving 
Um, Talbert and Knox, I think, is a really interesting one um, because they are looking at um, not just the context of the curriculum or the context of the classroom, they're looking at the context of the, the background of the students. So we all came into this room today with our own personal context, right? You have cultural background, you have a recent history, you have a long-term history, you have all of these pieces that make you who you are. So how, how, does, how do those pieces of context um, interact with the context of the classroom? And they look at can we make the context of the classroom a tighter fit to um, personal context. And then Rivet and Krachik, uh, Krachik um, looked at what's happening in the classroom, right? So can I, um, can I see contextualization in the moment as students are talking in the classroom? So all of that is great, but um, to me, there's a more fundamental level. There's, there's a bigger level that we can think about um, connecting the experience to the, to the content, connecting uh, content and context. Um, and so I was looking for something a little bit broader. So um, I, I think most of you have seen this from that paper, um, but I'm going to just talk you through building it a little bit. And so um, what we have here on this arrow is intended contextualization. So this is, this is the curriculum side of things. This is what you as teachers can do uh, to try and add context to your curriculum or build your curriculum around context. And so um, we move from content dominance to context dominance over here, and then there's a balance somewhere in the middle. Um, probably um, you, you're looking at this and you're seeing an ideal place um, for, for where education should be. Probably, I can't guarantee that for everyone. Um, but it's also probably different. If we were to survey the room, probably different people would think different places on this are, are better. Maybe field studies are better for one person. Another person might feel that case studies are a more effective tool. Um, what I would encourage is that we don't attach judgments to these. Um, I would not say that this is necessarily better than this. Um, it really depends on what you're trying to do. So it's more about targeting um, this to your, what your goals are as a teacher. So I'm just going to walk through what some of these look like. Um, so content dominance, right? So this is what you are almost definitely most familiar with. Um, you've come up through a whole lot of education already, right? And probably most of what you have seen in your experience has been this, right? So in a science example, the Krebs cycle takes place in the mitochondria, consuming oxygen, producing carbon dioxide and water as waste products, and converting ADP to energy-rich ATP. Um, so there'll be a quiz on this at the end, so make sure you get that down. <laughs> uh, that's how we do it, right? We, we say, here's this information. Um, I really need you to remember this. Right? We don't necessarily say why. Um, and maybe to the teacher, it's really clear why that's important. But for someone sitting in a classroom, it may not be. And again, there's not a judgment. There are times when this is actually totally appropriate, depending on your, on your goals. But that's what it looks like. Uh, we can add a little bit of context, right? So this is uh, uh, from a uh, fifth, grade, uh, fifth grade science curriculum um, by Foss. And um, you can see here, look at the wooden box under the desk lamp. Uh, the lid has two halves. One half has tiny holes, section A, and the other is solid, section B. Six beetles and six moths are put into the box. So lots of context there. The light is turned on, and 15 minutes later, the moths are all in section A while the beetles are in section B. Yada, 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 right? So, so there's a context. Um, and you can see how that could go either way, right? There could be seductive details where the student gets pulled away, or it could really help the student to understand, oh, okay, now I see what's happening. The beetles are moving, the moths are moving, um, and they can make sense of that. Um, but it's still really the goal of this is to get to that content. They added the context um, to make sure that the students could understand the content. Um, and then you can have uh, 
a problem-based learning situation, right? So I'm not gonna ask you to read all of this, but the idea is that there's um, this narrative problem. Uh, it's a physics problem. There's a, a car. Uh, it's all about this woman who owns this car. She's in medical school. She uh, crashes the car, um, and there's all these questions around um, so the first question is, why are air airbags safer than lap and shoulder straps alone, right? So very contextual question. Um, and you could, you could probably answer that uh, just by something you heard. You could answer that in a declarative way. Um, or you could dive deeper and answer that from the perspective of physics, right? So I can explain this in terms of energy, why, why one would be better than the other. She gets into the accident, there, you calculate the forces. Um, so then why would Tracy need an EKG and x-rays? Right, so that's totally unrelated to the forces involved in this car accident, but it's still bringing in that content knowledge from physics, right? So how does an EKG work? How does an x-ray work? Why are those useful? Um, but really, you're starting to get into um, delving into the context a little bit more, and then back to you know, who is right and who is wrong, who, when did she hit the brakes, how can you think about that? Um, moving over to um, project-based learning. Um, again, I, you probably can't even read that. Um, but what's happening in this problem is uh, there's just this framework that says um, there's what in my water, right? And so students are led through figuring out in their town what's in the water. Um, and from there, they, ha they, they start going down different paths, right? So what's in the water? Ah, oh, there's lead in the water. What's lead? Uh, what does lead do to the human body? Why does lead do that to the human body? Right, so there's all these different directions. The context leads you there. Um, there's still content, right? And the goal is still learning content. But you could end up in different directions depending on um, where you go. And this is where the importance of the teacher comes in to, to make sure you're not ending up in totally the wrong direction. Um, field studies you are probably familiar with, but it, um, this is when students go out into the field. I often think of ecology, but there's certainly other field studies you can do in other disciplines um, where students are trying to figure out something about this specific context. Right? It's, uh, they, um, they're deeply embedded in this context, and hopefully they will develop content knowledge that they can apply other places, but it's really about here. Right here, right now, what are the data telling me? Um, this next one, I'm not sure if you have this reference. Have you seen, the, has anyone seen this show? Okay, a couple people. So I saw this in a hotel room. So um, this is, uh, this is uh, what I would call discovery learning. So the premise of this TV show, Naked and Afraid, is that they take two people, um, they get to choose one thing, they'll choose a hatchet or duct tape or whatever, uh, that they're gonna bring out and they get planted in the wilderness for a month and they just have to survive, right? So it's, um, it's actually kind of compelling, I have to, I have to admit. Um, but the idea is that it's all about the context. They're not, I mean, maybe they're bringing some content knowledge in, but they have to figure everything out for themselves, right? There's no efficiency of, you know, a, a trusted guide who can help them figure it out. Um, and the one episode I saw, they did a really poor job of it. Right? And, and I, I think that's often the result of discovery learning if the goal is, is um, a specific content success, right? So, um, so that is all context. Um, even further on here, um, I would say deeply over contextualized. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, Scrabble, obviously I hope everyone knows Scrabble. The, the International Scrabble Championships um, every year, they're all in English, so the, the Scrabble game happens in English. But often the winners don't speak English um, because they have not learned the words which all have context for them. They have learned the patterns of letters, right? So they have no idea what the words mean. They just know that this is a pattern of letters, and it's a really effective pattern of letters to win this game, right? It's a three-letter word. If I use it on this triple-letter score, um, it's a really effective way 
um, to, to win this game. So they could not take any of those words and use them. Um, and again, it's not a judgment because they're winning this international competition, right? In that context, it works really well. But if the goal was to get them to learn English, um, it's a terrible approach. Um, and I, I do worry sometimes that when we're teaching languages, we teach, that, teach it sort of in this way. Um, luckily, we have the ability to learn language from everyone around us as we're growing up. But certainly learning a second language, um, we sometimes see this. Um, okay, so what are the implications for this? Um, Dewey wrote, uh, education in order to accomplish its ends, both for, the, both for the individual learner and for society, must be based upon experience, which is always the actual life experience of some individual. So regardless of what we're doing down here, um, there are implications for our learners. Um, and, uh, and that's this arrow up here. So this is realized contextualization. So just like anything in education, we have our intentions and then we have what actually happens. Um, so for those, of, is anyone student teaching right now in the middle of their student teaching? No one? Okay. It's just not where you are in your program. Okay. Well, um, so um, this happens, right? I mean, we try something in the classroom and it doesn't work, right? So there's always a divide between. I think that I was just trying to raise their hand. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. I wasn't going to call on you, I promise. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's, there are implications that may or may not work. Sometimes we try something and it works really well for all students. Rarely that's the case, right? So, there, so there's a divide between the intended contextualization and the realized contextualization. So let's look at that a little bit. So as I mentioned, um, with this discovery learning, there's the, uh, you end up with this over-contextualization, as in the Scrabble example. It, everything is embedded in the context. There is no or very little room for transfer to other contexts. Um, so it's learning without identified content. On the opposite end of the spectrum, um, we talked about the Krebs cycle, right? And um, abstract knowledge. And I've, I've really wrestled with what to call this. Started with decontextualized learning, but you can't really have decontextualized learning, right? It's, it's contextualized with something. And often at this level, it's contextualized in the classroom. It is academic contextualization. They, they, your students are connecting the content, to the classroom. Ah, yes, this knowledge is very useful. It's useful so I can pass my test. And then that's it, right? I don't need to know it again. Um, and certainly, we have all been there. Um, but overall, I would like to call that miscontextualization, or um, it is just contextualized in the wrong place. It is not an appropriate place for that content knowledge. Um, but really, um, most of what happens in the classroom is in this middle area, right? And so there's, there's this difference between secondary and primary contextualization where uh, secondary is learning with context, right? So it is, it is taking the content and it is adding some context to help make sense of it, right? It's, uh, it's narrative examples, it's all of this stuff, it's problem-based learning and case studies, uh, adding this, this context. And that is, is different than learning in context, when you are immersed in it. Um, if, I, if I was trying to learn French, this would be a great place to do it, right? Because everywhere I go, people are speaking French. And if I don't speak French, there are direct consequences, right? And so I, I get this reinforcement of um, not only small corrections in what I'm doing or saying, um, but everything around me is written in French. There's just all this available information. And that is very different than just having a very prescribed layer of context. Again, no judgments there. Um, so again, you get this, this whole spectrum that you can play with. And as a teacher or a researcher, you can play with this, um, but you can also play with this, right? I mean, you can measure this to see where your students are. Right? Are they, you tried this, did they end up here? Did they end up there? Where are they? Um, so this distinction between primary and secondary I think is really important, um, especially in the planning stages. What do I want to get out of it? Um, but in, in a, my lab's research, most of what we have found is that it's a little messier than that. And I, I hate to make an even longer word, 
I'm still playing with this. But there's, there's something about how these different levels of contextualization work together, right? So it's, we'll call it polycontextualization for now. If someone has a better one, that would be great. I'd love to hear that. Um, but as Dewey said, every experience is, move, is a moving force. Its value can be judged, uh, oh, I have two ons, judged on the ground of what it moves toward and into. So this is his idea of continuity of experience. It's not about one experience. It's about how experiences work together um, to, to generate understanding, to generate knowledge. And this is, this is really where the magic is. And, and I think it's complex as a teacher, um, but I think it can be figured out. How do I have a primary contextualization experience interspersed with a secondary, back to primary, secondary, maybe academic contextualization because that's an appropriate way to get a uh, formula in or something along those lines. But how do we weave those together? I, I think that's the frontier of, of where we need to move in this. Um, so, uh, in terms of measuring contextualization, this is, this is what I try to do. Um, I think that thinking of an experience is a useful tool. Uh, and, and when I say measuring, I'm certainly thinking as a reader, I'm also thinking as a teacher, right? If, if I'm measuring the contextualization of my curriculum or measuring the contextualization of what my students ended up with, that's, a, that's useful information. And so I think an experience is useful. Um, one downside of it is, is that it's retrospective, right? You can only know an experience after it has happened. Um, but I think it gives us a, a chunk of, of time and thought to, to work with. Um, so we can think about creating experiences um, that hopefully will result in an experience for, for our students. And if, if, every, if every piece of life experience in the classroom is the same for students, it's simply not going to be an experience, right? There has to be something compelling about an event to make it an experience. Uh, and so manipulating contextualization, I, I think, is, is one way to do it. Um, not sure how much detail to get into um, for all this stuff, but I'm just, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the projects that I've done uh, around this. Again, you're not going to be able to read some of this. This was just a, a rubric, a spectrum, uh, a rubric aligned to the spectrum that I've used um, to measure outcomes. So contextualization as an outcome, realized contextualization. Uh, and so, you know, the scale goes everywhere from um, no reference to any contextual component, and that might sound like, I just know that bioaccumulation happens in birds, right? So it sounds kind of fancy, right? The, the kid knows um, that word, but there's really, there's really nothing there. There's nothing to convince me that that student actually knows what bioaccumulation is. Um, and that goes all the way down to um, direct personal class experience is explicitly, causally credited with elaborated, elaborated um, science content knowledge. So I was really thinking about trophic cascades when we were doing the macroinvertebrate stream lab. I was out there in the stream and saw the trout eating the stonefly larva. I was pulling off the rocks. Later, in discussion, Jen men mentioned seeing that osprey grab a trout from the water. That's when I put it all together and realized that the osprey totally depend on whatever the larvae are eating. Right, so putting all that together. This, this was my experience. This was someone else's experience. I brought them together. I brought in this content knowledge. Um, so that is that. Um, and so what I did in this particular project, um, without getting into all the, the details, these are called Pathfinder Networks. Um, and with a, with a survey, with a tool, you can see how students organize their knowledge around a complex idea. That's what's tricky, right? And when you get to complex knowledge is, uh, with a multiple choice test, with a simple interview, it's hard to get to the complexity of understanding. And, and this tool basically allows you to do that and it maps it out and you can compare it to an expert. So I was able to look at um, you know, how they organize their knowledge, whether it was expert or not, and then um, how they came to that knowledge. Was it, how contextualized was it? And there was a correlation there. Uh, and another project, um, uh, again, this is uh, a little messy, um, but this is a, a project where I was working with a whole school district, and uh, the superintendent, do you use that word, superintendent? 
The head of, what is the head of a school district? Okay, okay. There, the commissar? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Um, so the, the head of the school district um, wanted to have STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, in every classroom and wanted it to be contextualized. And so she worked with me to do that. So every classroom in the district, kindergarten, first grade, language arts, history, had to have contextualized STEM in it, which I don't think was the right call, but it, that's where we were going. Uh, and so we hired a STEM coach. So we hired a person whose job it was, yeah. Just to make sure, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Thank you. Yeah, so a coach, a person to help make that happen. And so we trained her specifically in contextualization and how to really target the needs of the teacher, the curriculum, and outside resources, outside experts um, to bring those together. So it wasn't always just every kid needs to have primary contextualization experience. It was let's think about the right level of contextualization given the amount of time we have, given the expertise of the teacher, given the expertise that's available outside, and can we, can we do that? Um, and so this graphic that you're seeing here is social network analysis. Um, so if, if I were to look at your Facebook, I could tell who your friends are and who your friends' friends are and how connected you are. If, if you're that person that is really social and knows everyone, you're gonna be this big node in the center. Everyone kind of connects through you. And so this tool allowed us to see that. The teacher, uh, the, the coach, the STEM coach, uh, was, was serving that purpose. All of these nodes here are people from outside the district. These are scientists, engineers, farmers, uh, people who have knowledge of science and technology and, and math. Um, and she connected them to all these people in very targeted ways. Uh, so this graphic just, I think, is a good visual of, of showing that. But it can be done. We can, we can specifically use contextualization to, to make really significant changes in, in school districts. Um, this is another um, study, in fact, I just presented this. Uh, this is a little fuzzy, um, but you can kind of see there are these GoPro cameras. Are you familiar with these? These point of view cameras. Uh, the teacher's wearing and a bunch of students were wearing. Um, and so this allowed us to get in there and compare a classroom, a lab, and a field setting um, and see how students were contextualizing in real time. How are they using the context? Um, if we compare primary and, and secondary contextualization, is there any difference in how they're talking about things? Is there any difference in how they're using that knowledge? Um, and uh, lots of other questions too. But um, we can look at the individual level to see this contextualization. Uh, uh, there's a theme with messy graphics here, but uh, this is another study that we are wrapping up right now. Um, this is where we brought teachers and scientists together. And so we brought them together at, we, uh, our university has an experimental forest. It's a whole watershed, so um, uh, many, many hectares. I don't remember how many, uh, but huge uh, that scientists work in. Um, and so we, and then this is up at Mount Bachelor, our local ski area where we could access the whole mountain and work with snow scientists. So we brought the teachers and scientists together um, to develop curriculum so the teachers went out with the scientists they collected data and then they came back and built um, curriculum based on the teachers standards uh, that's the really short version and then what you see in this graphic is um, hopefully this looks familiar the secondary contextualization primary contextualization we looked at story so how did narrative and story um, weave through the different levels of contextualization Right, so if we start with what the scientists had to say and the data that the scientists brought, how did teachers take that, um, create their own story through their own experience, so this is the teacher's experience, um, lead their students through their own experience, and how, how did the stories change? How did the, the narrative um, flow move? And what effect did these different levels of contextualization have on that story as it, as it went through? Um, so, 
Um, there's still some open questions in this work, and I think open questions for research and open questions um, for practitioners as well. Um, I'm really curious about these thresholds, these, as you move from miscontextualization to, to, pri or to secondary contextualization, between primary and secondary, and, and secondary and over contextualization. How do you cross that threshold? Um, how do different people cross that threshold? What are the predictors of, of, of moving across those different thresholds? That's really fascinating. Um, certainly, um, the, the connection to one's own context. How do I bring that? Um, how do I, as a teacher, bring my context in? How does that articulate with the student's context that they're bringing in from home? Those are certainly open questions. Um, another one that's really fascinating is uh, visual, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. If you're looking at the world um, through these augmented glasses where not only are you seeing the real context, but now there's this layer of abstract knowledge on top of that real context, wow. Um, or virtual reality where you're in this fake but kind of real world, um, how, does, how does that impact learning? And, um, that's one I really want to do. Um, and then, of course, um, this, this connection between intended and realized um, contextualization. Can we be precise about that? Can we get to a point where we can um, have a tighter link between intended and uh, realized contextualization? So um, that is what I have for today. I'd be, <laughs> yes, I did, yes. It's context, right?